Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Tonight's tale, The Dollmaker, by J. Deschenay. My great-grandfather was always a quiet man. For a fellow who'd spent the first half of his life in the USSR, you'd expect him to have some stories. And maybe he did. He just never told any of them. Except for one. Once, back in the 80s, I was laid off. Thanks, Reagan. I picked up the side hobby of repairing antique dolls to make some money. My great-grandfather absolutely hated this, which made things incredibly difficult as I was caring for him at the time. One day, I would finally had enough of his complaining. Why? I demanded. What is your issue with dolls, Pravid? He took a deep breath and looked me in the eye. You want to know why I hate those things so much? Yes, I pleaded. Please. Please tell me, I want to understand. He took another breath. I've kept silent for so long, but you want to know, so you shall. He then raised his hand and wagged his finger at me. But I warn you, Dorogoy, you will wish you'd not asked. The story my great-grandfather told me is as follows. When he was young, he'd served in the militia of a tiny village. From what I can gather, it was a relatively peaceful place. The occasional theft was all the militia really had to deal with. That is, until the incident with the doll maker. On the outskirts of the village lived a man who made dolls and other toys for a living. My great-grandfather described him as a friendly but odd man with a wife and six young daughters. He was, I guess, an eccentric who was always trying to invent new kinds of toys and games for the village children. It sounded like he could never get it quite right though, and some of his creations wound up being the stuff of nightmares. He would take parts from a doll and use them to make trains. He would take out dolls' eyes and fill their heads with brightly colored scarves that the children could, in theory, pull out and play with. But none of his ideas really took off, as you might imagine. The doll maker became depressed at this. He grew increasingly despondent. Eventually, he started wandering around the village, demanding that children take his toys and play with them. He would scream and cry if they didn't. The militia almost had to run him out of town. Now one day, as great-grandfather was making his rounds through the village, he was approached by the doll maker's wife. Sir, she said, you must help me. I don't know what to do about my husband. He frightens me. My great-grandfather couldn't help but smirk. He seems to frighten a great many people, he said. Most of them are children. You don't understand, said the woman, who apparently did not appreciate the attempt at humor. Something is very wrong with him. He doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, I have to force him to wash, and he goes about with a strange look in his eyes. He keeps muttering to himself, saying, big and new, the children must have something big and new, and... The way he looks at me and at the children, I feel he may do something terrible. Now my great-grandfather was starting to take her very seriously. According to him, she was very nearly in tears now, and she was trembling. Is he violent toward you? he asked. No, but I fear he may become so. Well, you go straight home and tell him that if he does not come to his senses and stop behaving in such a strange manner, the village watch will have to come and pay him a visit. As the story goes, the dollmaker's wife looked skeptical, but then thanked my great-grandfather nonetheless and hurried back home. It was at this point in the telling that my great-grandfather paused. I watched in awe as a tear formed in his eye and rolled halfway down his cheek before he wiped it away. 
I had never before seen this man cry. It was quite some time before he resumed his tale. The doll maker was almost never seen after that. He didn't come out to the village square like he normally did. It was clear that he hadn't left town because the lights would be on in his home at night, but his shop never opened again after that. His wife and six daughters could still be seen in the village running their daily errands, but even they disappeared after a while. Everyone assumed that the dollmaker's wife had left him and taken the children with her. But other rumors began to swirl. Some people said that the dollmaker went completely crazy. Others said that he was praying to Satan for the return of his wife. No one knew for sure, of course, and any attempt to make contact with him was met with a curt, Go away! I'm busy! The villagers' curiosity about the dollmaker was just starting to die down, however, when suddenly, one day, he threw open his front door and ran from his home. He looked absolutely terrible. His skin was pale and stretched thin over his bones. Heavy bags could be seen under his eyes. He looked like a walking corpse, and yet the smile on his face could not have been bigger. With eyes wide and in a croaking, hoarse voice, he ran through the streets and shouted, Matryoshka! Matryoshka! He reached the village square where a crowd had gathered, and there he shouted the same thing to anyone within earshot. Matryoshka! At last! And then... According to my great-grandfather, the doll maker fell to the ground and never moved again. It was confirmed soon afterwards that the man had died on the spot. The task fell, of course, to the village militia to enter the man's home to determine exactly what had happened, what he was yelling about. My great-grandfather said the first thing that hit them, even before they went in, was the smell. He knew then that whatever they were in for, it was not good. Still, nothing could have prepared them for what they found. Upon entering his workshop, several questions were answered all at once. In case you didn't already know, a matryoshka is the name for those Russian nesting dolls, one inside the other inside the other. The militia learned at once why this had been the doll maker's last word and they also knew what had happened to the man's wife and daughters so stay scary my wildlings always remember no matter how obsessed you get your family are loved ones not raw materials and make the most of your nights <laughs>